Tonight we're going to be in the fifth chapter of Ephesians. Verse 19 and 20. Now to this point, Paul has had a lot to say about the collective believers in Corinth. Remember, there's a lot said to the to the group. Well, the whole epistle is written to the group. It's not written to some of the group, to all the group. And concerning their corporate status, their together status before the Lord, they had heard the word of the truth of the gospel. It was that this person heard it there and that person heard it there and so forth. They'd all had heard the same gospel. And they all had been sealed with the Holy Spirit. They all had believed been sealed with the Holy Spirit as, as a unit. And as a body of people, they had faith in the Lord Jesus Christ together, and they had loved the saints together. See, as, as a group, this was, this was so. They all had been dead in sins, but they all had been quickened. They all had been made nigh by the blood of Christ. They were all fellow citizens, plural, fellow citizens of the household of God. They all were being built together for habitation of God through the Spirit. They were all to understand what Paul was teaching. Yeah, amen. He made that clear in the third chapter that they all understood what he was, that, that was what the target was. God intended that they all be rooted and grounded and that they all be filled with the fullness of God as a group. This happened. All of them were to grow up into Christ. All of them were to put off the old man. All of them were to put on the new man. See, it was not enough for a few token members to do this. But you will be hard-pressed in a lifetime to find a congregation that is not viewed as a few token people make some advancement like this. That's not what this epistle is about. That's not what God is about. It's not what Christ is about. He's about the whole body growing up. If Jesus works through each person and only half of them grow up, how much work is he going to do? I mean, think the thing out. If this is his body and only three or four parts are functional, exactly what is Jesus going to do? You say, well, he'll do something. Well, he's not interested in doing something. That's why this you this whole group, and he's going to continue that in these verses tonight, the together view. He did. Paul didn't write a letter to each of the families at Ephesus. <laughs> this is how people do it today. They'd write a letter to each of the families. He wrote one letter to all of them. Now here's our text tonight, verse 19 and 20. Speaking to yourselves, plural. In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I know that these are things that every person should do individually, but that's not the point of this text. The point of this text isn't that you should do this individually, although we acknowledge yes, talking together here, speaking, <laughs> not thinking, yeah. speaking is an utterance, Amen. Yeah. speaking to yourselves, other versions say speaking to one another, that isn't like a conversation going here and a conversation going there, I mean, this is a body now. Speak to one another. <laughs> Speak to one another. Or just smile at each other. Speak to one another. Address one another. Joining with one another. Converse with yourselves. I mean, a lot of this is going on among us already, but. I, but it could certainly go up a couple of levels. Talk with each other much about the Lord. 
recite to one another and encourage each other. See, speak. You get the picture of a whole body of people, just a lot, a lot going on. Lots, at least a lot going on. Different ways. And this is why we arrange our gatherings the way we have. We're not saying this is the best, but it's we want it to be headed in that direction to make provision for this to kind of thing to happen. Amen. Some places this got there's no there's no place where this can happen unless it's maybe a class of some kind. There's there's no place where this kind of thing can happen. Where they can speak. Yeah. <laughs> and the word speak, if you were to spell it out academically, it means to talk or utter words or preach or say or speak or tell or utter. Just to emit a voice that can be heard. I want to be hasty to say this. Now, speaking plays a prominent role in the body of Christ. Amen. Very prominent role. <coughs> Solemnly, we are also to speak the same thing. Speak the same thing. The assembly is not a place for a diversity of contradicting views. This is what I think. This is what I. It's not like that. Paul spoke in a certain way to those who knew the law. He said, "I speak." To those who know the law, all right, I, he could speak a certain way. People knew the law, and he he said he spoke the wisdom of God, and he spoke to some of of the spirit. They said, yeah, "Let any man that's spiritual acknowledge that what I say." See, he's addressing speak. So speaking just isn't like speaking. I mean, it has an a, has an objective. It's directed to certain. You know who you're talking to, and you shape according to what you've seen and what you perceived to people you understand and comprehend. Paul could not speak to the Corinthians as under spiritual. So he had to he had to lisp an infant talk. It wasn't what he said wasn't true. It was just that oh, they, you shouldn't have to be. You shouldn't have to be eating baby food. You got teeth. You can chew. You can digest some things, but he couldn't speak to them. That he didn't stop speaking because he couldn't speak to him as undespiritual. He didn't stop speaking. He kept on speaking, but he spoke in words that the Holy Spirit taught, because he knew that his words weren't the weren't the thing that wrought the change. It was the spirit that used the words. Amen. And there's only certain words the spirit uses. Amen. Prophets were to speak under edification, exhortation, and comfort. And in speaking, understanding is preeminent. If people don't understand what we're saying, there is no point yeah. to saying it. That damage can be done by filling the air with something nobody knows what you said. You speak that's what they speak into the air. That's what, this is the language of scripture. They just if you if I said something here and I just I just talked to you like this, and it just and I really made a great tremendous revelation, something that filled my heart. I was just talking into the air. It didn't mean anything. That's why we often Make mention of this. That I understand some people haven't got it yet, but you got to get it. You got to talk to the person that's the furthest from you. Yeah. Uh -huh. but, but the furthest person I can see is Sister Gretchen. So I'm talking to her. I'm not talking here to Hannah. Uh -huh. Hannah will hear me if I, if I can talk to her. But this, you got to master this because speaking to one another is not just a, an exercise. It has a purpose. A valid assembly will make much of what's said when they're gathered together. Now, I, I don't know who you know that, quote, goes to church. I know you know a lot of people. But I, I, can, I know without even asking you that very few of them tell you what was said in the assembly, do they? No. Very few people. Why not? Because it wasn't important to them. Maybe it was something they already knew or whatever. 
But see, speaking is a critical part of the assembly. The assembly is a time when your mind is one of your biggest assets. Your heart and your mind. See, both of them, there are thoughts in them and intentions and purposes and the will and all this is in the heart and the mind and they become the focus of attention mm -hmm. so far as we're concerned. Yeah. In the body of Christ, we're addressing people's hearts and minds. For people to be more, made more stable, we want they, we speak so they can be comforted and encouraged. Listen, no one ever sat under the inner teaching of Jesus and was entertained. Right. Amen. Amen. Nobody ever said you ought to, you ought to hear the novel things he says. So he has such an eloquence, which he did, no doubt. But it's what he said. Yeah. It captured their attention. <coughs> and if people didn't listen to him, Jesus quit talking to them. Now salvation itself is an economy of understanding and knowledge. That's one of the chief traits about it. In the epistles, there are 26 references to understanding. In them knowledge is mentioned 45 times and know or knowing is mentioned 184 times. These are all activities of the, of the mind. From Matthew to Revelation, think of words like perceive, discern, comprehend. The mind is mentioned 80 times and thinking 28 times. We read about pondering and musing and considering and giving heed. And from Matthew through Revelation, hear or hearing is referenced 170 times. Now all of these have to do with something clearly being said and being taken in by the hearer. That's that's focus of the activity of the assembly. It's not novel sounds or jumping around or falling on the ground or all of that's been popularized, I understand, but it's not, you don't find it in Scripture. If anyone fell down in Scripture, they worshiped, or it was intelligent. They had their mind when they were on the ground. They weren't just rolling around down there. The very existence of the Scriptures tell you that God, the mind, is addressing the mind. Just the very fact that there's the Scriptures. The minds of men are active when profitable ministry is taking place. Then there's such things as illumination, enlightenment. See, that's, about, that's of the mind. <laughs> that's what that is. Mindless religion, that's associated with heathendom. Right. Speech that can't be understood, that's associated with barbarianism. <laughs> that's what the scripture says. But those in Christ... Edification presumes understanding. It's just not like a feeling. Comfort is just not a feeling or a calming. It's intelligent. Even the peace of God is like an intelligent quieting down to where you associate God with certain things and it calms your spirit. What you know calms your, calms your spirit. So when our text says speaking to yourselves, it doesn't mean Jane speaks to Mary. It does mean we speak among ourselves, to ourselves, that it's all public, but we're speaking, giving advantage to the brethren. This being the case, we're, we're stewards of our voices. Yeah. You are a steward of your voice, just as surely as you are of your hands Amen. or your feet. If you tried to do work with just one finger and your hand just had one finger that's like talking so nobody hears you yeah. Yeah. now we really got to understand this i really want to get this across how important, how important this is you're a steward of your voice and the god talks to people about speaking 
what, particularly when they speak something that he has said or something pertaining to God's people, you're talking to someone in the name of the Lord. Now, he's very specific about this. Through Isaiah, he spoke to the people. He said, lift up your voice. Cause it to be heard. That's Isaiah 10.30. Does anyone not believe that God meant that? Do you, are you guilty of saying something and not doing that? Who were you talking to? Hmm? Who were you talking to when you did that? When God said, lift up your voice, cause it to be heard. Now you may have to shout down some extraneous noise or something, but that's what he said. Amen. How about Isaiah 40 and verse 9 talking about the gospel? Lift up your voice with strength. Pour yourself into it. It's God talking now. Or Isaiah 58, 1. Cry out, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Jeremiah was told, go up to Lebanon and cry, lift up thy voice in Bashan and cry from the passages or the narrow places. Shout so that even when you're between two narrow places, they can still hear you on top. Shout it out. Balaam had a vision from God of the people of God. He said, the shout of the king is among them. That's <laughs> what he said. That's one of their traits. The walls of Jericho fell down, not at a whisper. I suppose God could have made him tumble down at a whisper. He told the people to shout with a great shout. The walls fell down. And you might remember that uh, when the Ark of the Covenant was brought back, the people shouted with a great shout. Now, we see if we're near the east. You kind of got to go to the east to see this, or maybe to a rock concert of some kind, to see this happen in our day, but this, they still do this. Shout. You don't hear anyone in, in these foreign countries talking quiet about the Lord. <laughs> it's a shout. And when the foundation of the house of God was laid in Ezra's day, all the people shouted with a great shout. Now what I'm showing here is that when God saved us, he saved our voice too. And any of God's people God's ever worked with, somewhere along the line, their voice come into the... When Moses read the law, had the law read to the people, the people had to verbally consent. I don't think they said all of them, others of you. A verbally, it had to be heard. The consent had to be heard. It's like having someone confess Christ. Before man, if we confess him before man, it's presumed it can be heard. The confession can be, can be heard. So what is to be said about being clearly heard? Well, a great deal. Speaking to yourselves, that presumes that what's said is clear and it's heard. Yes. Considering as with any other stewardship, it has to be used and exercised in order to be excellent. Mm -hmm. I was considering Brother Bob's uh, request for tonight, that mm -hmm. those who speak for the Lord, our yeah. ministers here, would be excellent in their speech. That's right. mm -hmm. That has to do with speaking forth and being heard, but it also has mm -hmm. to do with the way you handle the words mm -hmm. to give to the brother Amen. who are listening to. You want to be excellent mm -hmm. in presenting a sound case for them to consider. Amen. That's where the activity of the mind and the mm -hmm. brethren who hear it come into Amen. play also. Amen. Now, Brother Given, how would a, how would a person know you were like-minded with them if you never said anything. <laughs> That's right, you and, know. <laughs> and you don't actually have to, you know, you say something, I agree with it, I don't have to repeat what you said, I can just say amen. Amen. And that what well, that means I'm like-minded, I amen. agree, I see that. Amen. <laughs> Brother Given. Yes. There's another aspect of hearing. If I did what you did earlier, just mumbling a little louder, then you could still hear me, but you wouldn't really have to be able to understand what I'm saying. You'd be like a barbarian. That's a, yeah, yeah that's, that's another aspect of hearing is understanding what you hear. Yeah, that's yeah, right. That's yeah. Now he's got to focus on one particular aspect of speaking. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. This is a form of speaking. Isn't this good? Amen. This is a form of speaking. Not form of singing, 
it's singing, but it's a, the singing is a form of speaking, which means we don't want any no-brainer type songs. Yeah. Got to have a message, yeah. and uh -huh. by God's grace, that's what we sing here, a variety of different kind of songs, scripture songs, different kind of hymns, but they all are communicating, speaking to one another. So this is a form of speaking that can be very, very profitable. Amen. You get a lot in a kind of a short time and get it all together. In Psalms, now other versions, some versions read holy songs of praise. Psalms are generally understood to have been sung to the accompaniment of a musical instrument because psalm means pluck the strings, that's what it means. The 150th Psalm, for instance, speaks about these instruments. Praise him with the sound of a trumpet. Praise him with a psaltery and harp. Praise him with a timbrel and dance. Praise him with the stringed instruments and organs, that'd be wind instruments. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding. There's a lot of noise. When the people praised God, there was a lot of noise, but it was intelligent noise. And uh, with all these cymbals and trumpets, the folk had to be heard. They had to sing loud enough. They had to be, they had to hear what they said over the sound of all these clashing cymbals and trumpets. That's a loud <laughs> instrument. When they dedicated the temple, the singers sang and the trumpeteers played. And the scripture says they made, they lifted up their voice with a trumpet and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, He is good, for his mercy endureth to ever. That, and it was what they made one sound. The trumpeteers and the singers made one sound. So it was perfectly harmonious. Now I can tell you that praise to God and beating on a log wouldn't be hard. <laughs> it's, not, it's not one sound. One come from the jungle and one came from the spirit. See? So they were harmonious. They came one sound to the Lord. And what did the Lord do in this one sound, trumpeteers and singers? The glory of God filled the house. Cloud fill house. That's what happened. Psalms. So this psalms is a musical instrument accompaniment songs. There's some like some meter like to them. And hymns. We dedicate this to the people that discarded their hymnals. Yeah. How are you going to fulfill this, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The hymns. Now hymns considered different than a psalm. It's hard to define these words. You just kind of have to draw a general conclusion. But the consensus of the people is that the hymns were an extended, like extended thought. Like if you're thinking in terms of the kind of hymns we sing, like different verses, there's like a progression through the, through the song. There's like a progression of thought through it. And then also I read in the early days, Augustine and people like this, the world had songs, or bar songs and things like this, but the church made it a point not to have the same kind of tunes the world had. And a hymn was a unique, it was a unique melody. It wasn't like, like the world. See, we live in a time when people have set Christian songs to tunes the Beatles instituted. Oh yeah, now this happened. This is I'm telling you the truth. This happened. They use whirly tunes. Now this is I'm not making a law here. I'm just saying the early church was so sensitive about what they offered up to God. They just refused to put new wine in old wine skins. Yeah. Uh, rebuked the people because they were making music. Yeah. For their own selves That's right. and not for him. And whenever you try to mingle the world, what is the whole point of borrowing from the world? 
if, if a person's going to be honest, they're going to say, because I like it. Because that's the kind of music I want. Yep. I want to be, not that we don't enjoy the other, but it's not sanctified. It's, it's, been, yep. it's been used. And it's been used for other purposes than for the thoughts of God. Amen. And so it's, it's really an unfit vehicle for the thoughts of God. It should, it should not, the melody should not compete yeah. against the, the message that you're right. talking about this harmony. And when we're singing, two things. One, you know, you think of the expressions that David and some of the psalmists mm -hmm. had. These are high expressions. Amen. Now, we have experiences and perhaps feelings and, and, and motives and stuff that these psalms express. Mm -hmm. But we don't have the words they did. And it's teaching us as we're singing these things together. It's teaching us how to order our cause, how to express ourselves appropriately. Yes, we We're learning in these songs. Amen. Mm -hmm. uh, beside the, the value of the song itself, these hymns, I did jump ahead and read a sentence ahead of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but whenever you're talking about this extended thought and stuff, yeah. again, we, we are schooling our minds, if it were, by the Spirit of God in order to make a profitable expression to one another, even when we're not singing, and to God as we express ourselves to Him. Mm -hmm. And to be able to, to make a differentiation between this, the holy and the profane. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brother Gibbon, that's why I appreciate the hymns. That, what, like you've defined it as an extended thought. Um, in one of the renewals, I remember Brother Al kind of expounding that the scripture talks about how we stand in the grace of God. So yeah. you look behind in the past and you can see grace behind. Mm -hmm. And then you can consider the present grace yeah. that we have right now that's active. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the future grace that's, that's right. up yet ahead. Mm -hmm. And that's what a good hymn does. So it'll take yeah. you, the first verse you got your conversion. Yeah, that's right. See, and you look back and you see the grace of God, how it's touched you in that regard. And then the second verse, now you're growing in grace and sanctification and these things. But by the third verse, you've got some kind of conflict and Satan's buffing you. But by the last verse, you're in heaven. <laughs> That's right. See, so you can, you're able to to extol the name of the Lord and what He's done in the yeah. past, how He's mm -hmm. presently and actively working, and then the anticipation of grace that'll be given at the appearing of Christ. And so Amen. that's why I so appreciate this, and that's why it's so wrong to take hymns and chop verse three out, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. chop verse two out. And we're just going to sing one and four. To me, that that seems to be. Right seems to be an exposure of a person not understanding the nature of a hymn as a whole. Amen. Mm -hmm. It's intended to be progressive and to because the nature of the work of God is progressive and that's what's mm -hmm. so edifying about it is to see the progression of God's Amen. work from conversion to, to glory. And we like in the instrumental side we know in scripture that instrumental music drove a demon away. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. hmm? <laughs> and with the with the case of uh, Elisha, instrumental music caused the spirit to come up, or the prophecy to come on. So there's, see, the instrumental music is like, like, not like neutral. There's some music God uses and some he doesn't. Were you going to say something, Sister Tasha? Yeah, I was going to say that um, the Lord has never received anything mingled. Mingled. It's always, it's always pure. And mm -hmm. so for, for people to mingle the things of the Lord with the things of the world, he just, he won't receive it. Amen. Yeah, Brother Given, I can't remember the number of times that a music, a song, a hymn, would come to my mind and rescue me at, from certain, it's just, it just right when you need it, you, you start, you're thinking about this hymn and you can't get it out of your mind, yeah. and it rescues you from your trouble. Oh, amen. All right, that's Brother Jonathan. I appreciate you bringing out, like, the meaning of what these words are and this emphasis on um, not mingling like what you present to the God like the world produces, because there, there is a lot of emphasis on self and mute Christian music today. They have Christian stores, I've seen them, they say if you like these bands, they're secular bands, explicit content, sticker bands, if you like this, then you'll love this. It sounds like the world, it's how they attract them. And I actually hear people say, well, it's, it's just our way of praising God. We're all praising God, but this is the way we want to do it. 
And to me, it's if you, the moment you put focus on self, that completely neutralizes the whole thing. Let's say that tonight one of us wrote a stirring song to the tune of Jingle Bells. And the words were really good, you know. But when you sang it, does anyone wonder what we'd be thinking about? Okay, when, you, when you take the world's bag and you put the things of heaven in it, it, it just goes out. That's right. That's right. Amen. <laughs> yes. There's a, a ministry that the hymns have in uh, through the progression of time in a person. Uh, in my own uh, yeah. circumstance, from from the time I was a child, I heard this the hymns sung until the point where I was old enough to join in, and I I can look back on when the times when I remember singing a particular song and it will bring back memories that that I had not remembered it for a long time good things that there I can is. and uh, and even today when I sing a particular song that I've sung hundreds of times before it it can uh, encourage me in the, t the to remember all the time that I've spent serving the Lord to, to not allow that time to be wasted Amen. It, it's like you grow up with the hymns Amen. In, from, in my experience just just one more thing um, we've we've seen an emphasis like the lord's opening this up to us what it means to be the body of christ mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the things that we do as a body now see everyone has has a different function, but this is a this yeah. is a time when the whole body right. joins together in yeah. unity mm -hmm. in their thinking and in their expression. Mm -hmm. And even if you're not a speaker, you can still participate in the psalms and yes. hymns and spiritual songs. Amen. Mm -hmm. and, and I also wanted to address this thing Brother Tony brought up. See, this is a body thing too, mm -hmm. because I've noticed people that keep their eyes open when everybody else is praying, when it's their turn, they shut them. Mm -hmm. Why is that? <laughs> Why don't they just pray with their eyes open looking all over and, mm -hmm. you know, it's because they're concentrating then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're not doing that when other people are praying, then you're not praying yeah. together as a body. That's right. You are. The yeah. other, whoever, yeah. Whoever's thinking about what the other brethren are praying and joining in with their heart, they're praying together. Yeah. You're just praying by yourself. Mm -hmm. So you might, you know, you could have stayed home and done that. It does. It's not a body function for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is this is a body thing with the the singing. Oh too. yes. Mm -hmm. Now in hymns, so good, Sister Barb. Well, I was considering your point here is uh, speaking to one another with with these ways yes, of, right. of mm -hmm. employing the mouth and. One other aspect of this is that this is a way that the, the author of the song is speaking to us. Yes, uh -huh. still, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. so time has transcended. A lot of these authors aren't even living in the body anymore, yeah. but they are still speaking to us through what they the have spoken Amen. in the hymns. <laughs> and we can pick it up and speak Amen. to one another. It's either in the body. Yeah. Remember that there's a sense. Uh -huh. One of our recent renewals, this was introduced, and it, there's a sense in which the whole th body and heaven is gathered together at the same time. That being the case, these these men, their spirits, yeah, uh -huh. are no doubt among us. See, yeah, uh -huh. yes. These, these songs too, and these things that are spoken, will be things that we will still be able to sing and speak about once we are all gathered together in That's glory. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is that we may say some. This is that. <laughs> yes. Something else. Um, I was considering is these hymns and songs that we have. Um, written by brethren who um, may have passed on already, they wouldn't, the hymns wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for God giving those words and mm -hmm. show, opening the eyes of those people. And today, you can go into some of the Christian bookstores, and if the word Christian bookstore was not in that particular store, I wouldn't be able to tell whether or not yeah. it was Christian music. So I'm thankful for even, um, there's people, some people today who will make a whole album of like 25 hymns. And so it's very, it's, 
it's very edifying to be able to go and get something like that and not that we can be ministered to by that and not have just nothing to be ministered yes. to music. This, Amen. this attitude is, has crept in for some time. I remember specifically in Florida, there was a young man that was supposed to be a youth minister. And he's over at the elder's house with a bunch of people, and he played this song. And it was supposed to be to the Lord. He looked over at me, he says, you know how I got that song? I said, no. He said, well, I wrote it for my daughter, Yvette, and then I just changed it to Lord. What do you think? I says, I think you ought to put Yvette's name back in it because the Lord doesn't want your second-hand song. I <laughs> just <laughs> <laughs> matter of him. Go ahead, brother. Well, just also a note about the way the hymns were composed. The people composed them in a very skilled way. No one, like, just Bruce just jumbled something together. I mean, it's like it's put in parts where, like, professionals, people sing it. Like, we, um, we practice hymns together here where we practice parts. You know, like the body of Christ, there's different functions, but it's all for the same goal. And anyone that was serious about the Lord that composed these hymns, they gave it like it was a really skilled, like masterpiece yeah. kind of a song because it was devoted to the Lord. Skilled singing, yeah. You remember when Jesus the night he was betrayed, when they left, they sang a hymn. Remember that? Sang a hymn. Now, we don't know what constituted that hymn. Jewish historians say it was uh, the 113th through the 818th Psalm that was traditionally sung by the Jews after the Passover. Now, of course, there's nothing in the Bible about this, but that's what they say it was. But And that 114 through 18 were sung after supper. And I don't all area have is Jewish history, but I'll tell you up front, I find it very difficult to believe Jesus would sing a hymn from the 113th to 118th Psalm. I find that I don't think the expressions are strong enough for the occasion. Christ isn't in them intentionally. Maybe by figure and I understand. But I don't I don't I don't go, go with that sort of thing. my mind when I hear about these um, musicians who mix together worldly tunes and things with scriptures. The first thing that comes to my mind is Babylon. That's right. Mm -hmm. That is right. Now there are people that are, we're not saying it's wrong to sing from the Psalms, God forbid. There's some glorious Psalms that reflect redemption and so forth. And there are some people that sing only from the Psalter which is a song book where all the psalms are put to music. <coughs> There's nothing wrong with singing those, you understand. But at some point, the singing's got to get some of the new covenant and some of the apostolic doctrine and some of the lofty teachings of the apostles. It has to get in the singing some point. Yeah, that's right. yeah. You can't limit it to those pre-new covenant expressions they foreshadowed I understand that but they that that is the point I like to sing about the substance as well as the shadow Amen. and he says notice the versatility psalms hymns spiritual songs so it's virtually any kind of legitimate singing falls in that category spiritual songs these are considered inspired songs of the Spirit. In other words, they're songs that resulted from like a burst of insight. Like, oh, I forget the song now, but man had lost all his family and wrote this, It Is Well With My Soul. And there on the side of the boat, he got a burst of insight. That was a spiritual song. Now, the person, it may be a burst of insight that comes from the fellow who, person who wrote the song, but it may also be a burst of insight from the person singing the song. Yeah. All of a sudden, there's some facet, some, there'll be a phrase in some of these songs that are illuminating phrases. Yes, right. So a spiritual song is one that particular deals with the opening of the eyes of the understanding, 
A hymn would be a song of insight that was able to see like an extended thought. A psalm would be a song that charged the heart and was comforting and calming and this sort of thing. But see, there's, this, there's quite a versatility here. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing. And see, in the singing, we're speaking to one another. <laughs> you know, that's a wonderful uh, thought. Now, singing is also connected with joy. Sometimes it's with mourning. Sometimes there's laments. But it was with joy. Now, there's a statement made about Israel when they were in the Babylonian captivity. Psalm 137. <clears throat> It shows where there's no joy, there's not much singing. It's just the way it is. Here's the 137th Psalm. Here's where here's how it reads. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept and when, when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps on the willow trees in the midst thereof. For there are they that carried us away captive, required of us a song. They that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. See, they were good singers, apparently joyful melody. They said, Come on, give, give us a concert. They said, How can we sing the Lord's songs in a strange land? Well, the assembly is not intended to be a strange land. <laughs> now, I've been in assemblies that are a strange land, but they. That's not how they're intended, and there's a certain there's a certain joy in in being able to express truth that does something for your heart. Speaking to one another, you're not like listen. When you're singing together, you're actually you're not listening to your own voice. You're listening to the united voice of the people. Now, God has done a, quite a remarkable work among us. I don't know if you've all noticed it or not. These recordings of our singings, you can understand every single word. That's a unity there. Boy, I'd say, it, no, it's amazing. I'll tell you, it's amazing. You've got young people, old people, men, women, boys, girls, and you won't miss one word of any song. It's perfect speaking to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And sometimes we all learn a new song. I got the thing in my mind. I'm singing it all day long, you know. But it all was spawned here in the assembly. Singing the... I was thinking about this while you are talking that some songs actually they have like an expiration to them. You know, they're for this world. You won't be singing in heaven on camping in Canaan. That's right. You know, there's but they see they were very important while we were here. Right. They they had a ministry, but you can see how that's uh, they're going to be their ministry is going to be filled up. <laughs> Yes. Well, people, uh, they only sing songs that they understand usually. I mean, in the world, you too, you know, like they're attracted to things that talk about themselves or talk about how mm -hmm. they are or whatever. So mm -hmm. a lot of the groups don't like the hymns anymore because they don't have an understanding. <laughs> uh, so right. therefore they can't sing them that's because right. they don't know what they're like. How do these pertain to us? So mm -hmm. uh, that's one reason why, because of the lack of understanding. That's right. Now see this, yeah. some people are trying to adapt the song so those kind of people can understand. But see the, the grandeur and majesty of Christian singing has a drawing effect to those who are of a, a honest and good heart. It has a drawing effect. Now he says making, making melody in your heart. <laughs> So our heart is accompanying, <laughs> is accompanying the song. That's our primary accompaniment, is our heart. It's a perfect tune. Now, we, some one of the brothers and sisters played the piano while we were singing and played a different set of notes than we were singing. We would say, that's, that's no good. Stop the, stop the playing over there. We've got to be in concert. Well, that's the same with your heart. Your heart's in tune with your speaking. And you're making the melody in your heart. Your what's in your heart is what's given the attitude yeah, that's right. to your expression. 
Now the book of Colossians also mentions this, but it adds a little something else. Colossians 3, 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So how's that? So here we have just speaking, but Colossians, it's teaching and admonishing. Yeah, there's a song we used to sing, Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? See, it'd be a admonition. Some songs, that they're admonishing one another. Others were teaching one another. And he has one other, one other sentence here. Now, this is a, a together exercise. So here's the singing part we just covered. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's a continuation now speaking one to another. One to another. Speaking, singing is one form. Giving thanks is the other. Other versions that say, give, you say always giving or at all times. See, thanksgiving is a free will offering. <laughs> yeah. It's not a mandatory thing, although if you want to look at it that way, in a sense it is, but it's a it's an offering to the Lord. Thanks for all things. The Living Bible says, or Net Bible says, thanking for each other. <laughs> well, that's not what that's not what the verse says. For all not for some things. So the text in Thessalonians that says, in everything give thanks. And so I've heard people say, you can't thank God for everything, but in every situation. Well, here's, uh, here's the others one here. They didn't know this was in the Bible. Yeah. Thank you for all things. Thank him for all things. All things is what stands between your birth and your death. <laughs> There's something good in everything that happened from your birth. There's some aspect of it that's good. But all things because we know that all things work together for yes, good. Right. And all things are of God. Yeah. We got those two those two factors, all things are of God, and God works all things together. You give a thanks yes, amen. that this thing doesn't stand by itself. So here's this part of your life that you would to God, you didn't live it. Now you can say, I give thanks for that part that it doesn't stand by itself. Yes, God wove it into a beautiful tapestry. Yes. And I wouldn't be what I am now if I wasn't what I was then. <laughs> yeah? Another text that emphasizes this, as I mentioned, is 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks. This means while you're in the circumstance, while you're bobbing up and down in the sea, a night and a day and a night and a deep, give thanks you're still on top. Hmm? While the ship is breaking up in the storm, give thanks that we're still, that we're still on board. You're making your way to shore. You give thanks. There's a board I could in everything. So find <coughs> if you're going through difficult times, and if you're not now, you will. You will soon. There's something in there you can give thanks for. That in this, you in this, you can give thanks. Thank God, this isn't the only kind of thing that happens to me. Thank God this isn't something i got to learn to live with all the time. Thank God I'm going to be delivered from this. <laughs> There's give thanks. Yes? I think about Brother Paul who said, I know this is going to work out for my Amen. salvation. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. You know what you said about all things, you liken it under a tapestry. I thought that was wonderful because <laughs> I immediately thought of Joseph. Yeah. A lot of things happened to Joseph, and he didn't have an explanation for all yeah. these things. But, you know, he was a reflector. He, we know he thought over his life because when his brothers thought that after his father died he was going to take revenge, you remember his testimony? Mm -hmm. yeah. That he said that what you meant for evil, God meant for good to save alive many people. And so he had reflected 
That's Those right. are all the ways in which God led him through everything. He was able to give thanks to behold God's hand in all things. That's right. Mm -hmm. See, he, he was able to come to Pharaoh's throne and take over right away, but then he'd been trained yeah. in management. He had management training there at Potiphar's house in the prison. <laughs> Moses, he had to lead these people, he, but he had management training with keeping sheep for 40 years. So he could give thanks, see? And if you look at your, at your life this way, you peruse your life with this in mind, you'll find that your experiences all work together to get you ready for where you are now. Uh -huh. You'll actually be able to yes, see that. And when you do, you can give thanks, mm -hmm. you know, in all things. <laughs> under God the Father, under God the Father, we're in the assembly. See, but we're not thinking the assembly. We're to God the Father, <coughs> the God and the Father. Now the word "and" is there in the text, both in the original and the English. God and the Father. The word translated "and." Here's the academic meaning of it. Also, even, indeed, and but. Means he's God. Now this may sound like it's contradictory, but he's Father, see? Father seems like it's a lot, a little bit lower than... But it's not, not in the case of God. God and, it's all, both, both are up here. And the Father. The origin. The keeper. One that started it. When it's going to finish it. The one that's making it work now. See? God and... Heathens, they'd have more than one God. See, they have a God of this and a God of that and a God of the other. But we have one God and He's God and Father. He's God so He can do something about your situation. You can approach Him because He's Father. <laughs> See how that works together? <coughs> It'd be inappropriate at this point to call him our father. That's not the point here. The. Well, let's think of what he's the father of. He's the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 15, 6. He's the father of glory, Ephesians 1, 17. He's the father of spirits, Hebrews 12, 9. He's the father of lights, James 1, 17. Does he be in fathers bigger than just us? There's other things that follow in God being Father. If you're going to want mercy, you've got to get it from the Father of mercies. So by saying giving thanks to God and the Father, we're formally, publicly acknowledging we see His greatness and we see that we've come this far by His grace. We're, see, we're formally confessing that. But it's in the... Um, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The apostles never talk about God without bringing Jesus into the equation. God does have pity on humanity. The scriptures say this. Like a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him, for he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are but dust. But blessings are conferred because of Christ. To do something in the name of Christ is just not to recite a formula. That's not what he's talking about. It's to offer thanks while you're in an active fellowship with Christ. You're, you're joined with Christ. And the mind of Christ is in you, see? And you're, you're praying what Jesus would pray. In this condition, this is what Jesus would pray. And you it isn't that you studied this all out. You just... You're joined to the Lord, you walk in the Lord, you fellowship with Christ, and pretty soon his mind, you've got, you're thinking like he thinks. That's praying in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The person who gives thanks to God and the Father in the name of Jesus is one in whom Jesus is dying and living. As 1 Corinthians 4, 10, 11 says. The dying of Jesus in our mortal flesh, the living of Jesus in our mortal body. So both of them are happening in you. So it's just, it's, just, it's no different actually than the Lord Jesus bringing this, bringing this prayer up to God. Now I remember in that the uh, passage here is about the activities of an assembly. 
we obtain an accurate framework of the accurate picture of the framework in which the working of the Lord occurs. What kind of environment is is where there's singing of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, speaking to one another, where there's the giving of thanks? This creates an environment Amen. Yeah. in which God works because He's central. Works in which God works toward His people. Let's be specific about this. That in the assembly, it isn't just that we're receiving something that we are going to give to somebody else, although that, that is true. But we are receiving something because we need something. We need these things to survive. We need these things to finish the race. We need these things to glorify God. That's, and we're meeting together because this is the distribution point. Amen. Yes, we get things. We can pray ourselves and get things, and sometimes this is necessary. But the bulk of what you receive is going to come from some, some other believer. That's how it's going to happen. The bulk. That doesn't mean that you won't receive anything yourself. You will. But the more people of God you're around, you gotta have you gotta enlarge the reservoir. <laughs> you gotta enlarge it. So as you can see, there's uh we are the body of Christ and members in particular. And what we've talked about tonight, speaking to one another, that's a particular ministry. Of the members, particular, but God's working through that, through that those collective expressions. Well, to me, it's it's quite a marvelous arrangement. Amen. Amen. And if you have a word you'd like to say before we close, Sister Barbara. Giving of thanks in all things, it's like inspecting our circumstance and dismantling it until we can find something in it that's going to sustain us to get through it. In a hard circumstance, you find something that the Lord has given you there to give thanks with, and then that's what's going to be able to strengthen you to endure to the end. You that's hold right. to that as a promise. Amen. Mm -hmm. There. A couple of things. One that Jesus said, of course, was the, an answer to a question: "Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength." He broke down our composition in four categories. And then when Paul prayed for the Thessalonians, he prayed that they would their, yeah. their spirit, soul, and body yeah. be preserved unto the coming. So those are those are parallel views Amen. with just a little different little different angle. But those Jesus' four categories and Paul's three categories encompasses everything that we're made of. Amen. And speaking involves the certain parts of that of that composition. Like obviously the mind, heart and mind are involved in speaking. Singing, while there's a lot of similarities between speaking and singing, singing involves other parts of our constitution that speaking doesn't. Yeah, that's right. It's yeah. part of our walk of faith in working out our own salvation with fear and trembling to sanctify every capacity every pitch, yeah. and every uh, ability yeah. that the Lord has given us, and singing uh, sanctifies part of that expressive capacity that speaking doesn't. Amen. The, the fact is, we are soulish beings. There are some facets of religion that overemphasize the soulish part yeah. to, to the detriment of heart and mind, yeah. and other facets of religion go the other way, That's emphasizing right. the heart and mind right. and neglecting the soul. But the the Lord is saving all of us, Amen. Um, and so that that it's singing. You mentioned this. It's not the most excellent way to view singing as a segment of the of the service that we have to we have to engage ourselves in because this is tradition or what or what. It, think of it as a provision. This is a help to us yeah. in order to sanctify mm. that soulish part of you. And every one of us know that the soulish part of our of, of our beings can give you a lot of trouble, mm -hmm. and what a provision Amen. that we can think about the uh, this in connection with. Here's another provision of doing your work heartily as unto the Lord. That sanctifies that part of our existence mm -hmm. in this world to the Lord, mm -hmm. so we can work to the Lord. And singing sanctifies part of our of mm -hmm. the soulish part of our being. Amen. Mm -hmm.
And, and uh, I've been exposed to some thinking and some history and so forth. I wonder if you have been. That our generation is not the only one that's had this controversy about styles of music. Mm -hmm. There are other generations that have as well. Uh, they used to sing just out of phonal music or something like that. Uh, no parts. Uh, what, what have you heard about that? Well, you know, Isaac Watts introduced singing of, singing of parts, more skillful singing, you know. Hebrew singing was more like a chant, but it wasn't without melody. That's not, that's not what, what we have today. That type of thing is not what we have today. We have people... The controversy? The, yeah, the controversy is different. The controversy because people have already developed an appetite for one kind of music. That's not, as the church grew, like I think Watts saw a need to be more skillful in singing, so he introduced a different different kind of singing. It was more, it wasn't like a chant. So he was driven by something more he wanted. That's not what's driving the controversy today. And if it was, these people would write their own kind of music, but they don't. They borrow their kind of music. You know, we sing today was a was a kind of music created by the people of God. Yeah, I've, I've, now we've got some people who are instrumentalists. If I was a gifted min, min, instrumentalist. I would take these great hymns of the faith that everybody knew and I'd make them live yeah. with, without writing a new tune, but just with skill, like David played skillfully on the harp, I'd, I'd, I'd play them skillfully, make them live, and some people can do this, they can, they can take a song you're familiar with and they make it live, you know, just by the way they play it. Like David played the harp. Yeah, Brother Handel had a, an excellent yeah. spirit about this, taking the Psalms and taking the gospel and setting it to music to where it, it it's like burn itself into your consciousness. Yeah. He had to build see some of these Handel Messiah does this and some hymns they build up to a intellectual crescendo. Yeah. They build up to it and that that People that say that they always have always had a distinction of music, but number one, it didn't split the church. Though they didn't have half the church with this and half the church with that, so they're making an uh, they're making an ignorant comparison. Yeah, brother Paul. The world even recognizes its own failure in uh, its music and its skillful and its lack of skill, rather. Like, um, your brother, your brother Toby, Rick, he could attest this as well, is that when you're learning music theory in, in school, they don't teach you these things in the world. They say, go to your local church, find a hymnal, mm -hmm. and pull that out, and you're going to learn music theory with that hymnal. Yeah. I mean, that's what I did when I was at, uh, when I was at Ball State. And that's, they said, here's a hymnal, you're going to learn how to do music theory with this. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because even now I can go, as we're seeing, I can see, I can actually visualize all those chord diagrams, mm -hmm. and how all these things move along as I'm seeing right. this. It's just, it's remarkable how there's that recognition of that skill, even by the world. Mm -hmm. William, mm -hmm. a, a great majority of these hymns and spiritual songs we have been given to us, brethren who, uh, had to live through a circumstance. God yeah. kept them mm -hmm. through a circumstance. Yeah. They had an insight, and they it, it became a, a song. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, other brother got up and, and it became a sermon, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. a, and a, a, a gifted word behind the pulpit, so to speak. Yeah. But others made a song, mm -hmm. uh, and we still have them. Oh yeah, we've got a song in one of Shepherd of Eager Youth, written by Hippo, in one ten. Now here's something else that these people don't tell you, that all through history, the church has added to its song arsenal. It never did replace 
it always added. So in Spurgeon's day, they had a, quite a number of hymns, but they were all, they added them, so they compiled ones, they added to it. But see, that's not what, that's not what people were advocating. They advocated replacement. Yeah, right. They are going to take hundreds of years, if you go back to Hippo, they're going to take 2,000 years of songs and throw them in a garbage can and replace them by songs written by people that whether they were converted or not is sometimes an issue. So the comparison is not the same. If any valid song written today, and we've got some, John Peterson, he's, a, he's passed away now, <clears throat> but his songs were added. <laughs> Incidentally, just we were uh, living in Indiana when John Peterson began to be well known, <clears throat> and he was considered by generally by the church populace as a shallow hymn writer. Everybody thought this. Today, he's considered one of the deep songwriters. Because <laughs> his songs are all kind of, they're kind of simplistic. Heaven came down and glory filled my heart. And there's not that, not that they're wrong, but they're, they're of a different, they're a little more simple. But today, they're thought to be profound. Yeah. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time we've had together, and we pray that in our assemblies that we would more and more be noted for activities that require your presence and your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.